Hello, and welcome to the webinar series of the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network, or ECPN, a network of the American Institute for the Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. My name is Jen Munch, and I am the webinar coordinator for the 2017 to 2019 term. Today's webinar is entitled, Lights, Camera, Preventive Action, Careers in Preventive Conservation. Before we turn to today's program, I'd like to quickly familiarize everyone with the GoToWebinar program. You can use the control panel to make modifications to the audio settings. All attendees are automatically muted by the program, but you can communicate with us and ask questions throughout the webinar using the question box. If you are watching this webinar with a group of people, please let us know how many using the question box. If you'd like, you can also hide the control panel with the orange arrow at the top of your screen. I'd like to take a moment to briefly share information about ECPN and our webinar series. ECPN is a network within AIC that is dedicated to supporting conservation professionals in the first stages of their careers. Please visit our page on the AIC website, our Facebook page, or our Wiki of Resources for Emerging Conservators for more details about our activities. ECPN has an ongoing interview series with conservators and specializations that require particular training. On the AIC blog, you can find recent ECPN interviews with conservators who specialize in the care of East Asian art and electronic media. You can also find ECPN interviews with United States citizens who trained abroad and are currently practicing conservation in the US. Now a bit about our webinar series. ECPN organizes two webinars each year on topics relevant to emerging conservators. Our webinars are all recorded and the full videos are available on the AIC YouTube channel. If you have any ideas for future webinar topics, feel free to contact ECPN at the email you see on the screen or post suggestions on the ECPN Facebook group. I'd also like to mention AIC's Co Collections Care Network or CCN. CCN was created in recognition of the critical importance of preventive conservation as the most effective means of promoting the long-term preservation of cultural property and to support the growing number of conservators and collections care professionals with strong preventive responsibilities and interests. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our three speakers for today's webinar, Lights, Camera, Preventive Action, Careers in Preventive Conservation. Dr. Joelle Wickens is the Preventive Conservator for Winterthur Museum, Gardens, and Library, and Associate Director of the Winterthur University of Delaware Program in Art Conservation, WUDPAC, where she also teaches preventive conservation. Today, Joelle will give an interview of preventive conservation and speak about some of the skills, activities, and training it encompasses. Jamie Gleason is the Associate Preventive Conser Conservator at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Jessica Pace is the Preventive Conservator at New York University Libraries. After Joelle's introduction, Jessica and Jamie will join us for a facilitated discussion about their own career pathways into preventive conservation, as well as their own roles and responsibilities within their respective institutions. If you would like to see more extensive biographies for our speakers, please visit the blog post regarding the webinar on AIC's blog, Conservators Converse. So let's get started with jo Dr. Joelle Wickens, who will discuss what preventive conservation is and why it is so vital. Thanks, Jen. So as Jen said, I'm going to take you through a 15 minute introduction to what preventive conservation is. I'm going to share what I love about preventive, how preventive is formally and informally defined, what specific tasks and skills preventive involves, the, and the wide variety of paths you can take to get to a job that involves preventive conservation. My ultimate goal is to show you that preventive conservation is important, a powerful tool in the preservation of cultural material and something that is diverse and appealing to people from a wide variety of backgrounds and interests. So, whoops. What is it that I love about preventive conservation? First, I love that I spend more of my time working with people than with objects. And these people are found in all the departments of the institution in which I work. I came to conservation to preserve the objects that inspire and help us grow. 
but I also love working with people and helping them achieve their goals. Preventive conservation offers me the perfect balance. On the screen, you see categories that represent the people I have worked with in the last two weeks. I created this slide by looking back at the past two weeks of meetings and activities on my Outlook calendar. It is my job to work with each one of these people to achieve the collective goal of the preservation of the entire collection at Winterthur, while at the same time providing access to it for all who need and desire it. So I still get to work with objects, but I also get to help many people be successful in their own jobs. The second thing I love about preventive conservation is that I get the opportunity to impact entire collections rather than individual objects. I initially trained as a textile conservator at the Textile Conservation Center in the United Kingdom. On the screen are the before and after treatment photos of one of the most extensive treatments I have ever done. It is a flag believed to have been created by Clarissa Wilson, the daughter of Betsy Ross. It arrived in the Winterthur Textile Lab in the condition you see on the left with a bag of hundreds of additional silk fragments. The process of getting it to the point on the right included over 500 hours of stitching. It was an intensive process that I absolutely loved. However, for a variety of reasons, my work has transitioned from this kind of treatment to the care of entire collections. As I care for these collections, my focus is on keeping damage from happening in the first place. I love knowing that I am doing all that we can do to keep objects from ever arriving in the condition of the flag on the previous slide. It will never be possible to keep everything from getting damaged. We will always need interventive conservators who can work on damaged objects. But for me, being part of the process of protecting hundreds and thousands of objects is what I love. The third thing I love about preventive is that I am constantly developing skills that can be applied in almost every situation. Preventive techniques can be adapted to address the preservation of objects in major museums, historic houses, libraries, archives, private collections, fine arts museums, archaeological sites, contemporary art collections, conservation science labs, big cities and small towns, really anywhere in the world. I love that my skills are portable, adaptable, and ever-changing. And finally, the last thing I love about preventive conservation that I will share with you at this point today is that preventive conservation gives me the opportunity to preserve the material culture of all people. I feel called to be part of a world that is encouraging and strengthening our abilities to live with, respect, and enjoy people from absolutely all backgrounds. Because preventive skills are so portable, I see the practice of preventive as my best option for doing this. So you should get the point that preventive is something I believe in and love, but what is preventive conservation? One place to start is to answer that, to answer that question is here, a definition pulled from the Code of Ethics and Code of Practice practice of the Australian Institute for Conservation of Cultural Material. This is my favorite definition because it is relatively concise and highlights two of the main aspects of preventive that set it apart from other conservation specialties. In orange, you see the words control of the environment. This points out that in preventive, we very rarely actually change the object but we constantly control and change the environment around the object. The second set of words highlighted in orange points to the fact that preventive is as much about setting up the policies and procedures that can take place without us as it is about doing the work ourselves. This is another definition of preventive that I go to quite often. 
It was introduced to me by Rob Waller, an expert in the implementation of risk assessment, particularly in natural history museums. As you read this, you may think, well, all conservators should be doing this. And that is absolutely true. Um, the code of ethics of many conservation organizations make that very clear. And through the words they use to describe preventive, it is the most effective, the primary objective, the essential responsibility, and of critical importance. All historic preservation professionals must do it. It is the most effective way to preserve our culture. But in a world where we are focusing more and more on sustainability, where some people like Glenn Wharton are choosing to define preventive conservation as sustainable conservation, we need to be encouraging all of those involved in the preservation of cultural heritage to be practicing it, and we need to encourage more and more people to specialize in it. So what does preventive conservation look like in action? The next 11 slides will walk you through some of the primary tasks of those doing preventive conservation on a regular basis. Some practitioners like me will do a little of all of these. Others will specialize in one or more areas. When we speak of environmental management, we are referring to the process of managing relative humidity and temperature, as well as pollutants in the environment around an object. This can mean creating a microclimate for a panel painting, like you see on the left. In this situation, the frame is constructed in a way that will allow the environment to remain stable inside the frame, even when the outside environment fluctuates. These kinds of microclimates can be made in other types of frames, display cases, and storage containers. But environmental management also includes the world of maintaining RH temperature and pollutant levels in whole buildings. And this requires knowledge of passive and active control systems. For this re reason, training includes developing knowledge of how HVAC systems work. Light can damage objects in a variety of different ways. If we could put objects in the dark all the time, we could protect them from this damage, but then we can't see them. And what's the point of keeping an object that will never be seen? So we manage light levels. We set limits, measure to make sure we are meeting the limits, as you can see on the left, put systems in place to reduce light as necessary, and track changes to the objects in our care with things like colorimetry, which you see on the left on the right. Many pests, including insects, mammals, and microorganisms, damage objects. Moths eat wool, termites eat wood, mice eat almost anything. To prevent this kind of damage, again, we put systems in place to keep the pests away. We then actively check vulnerable locations for pest activity. In the photo on the left, Joel is looking for pests in the wool fabric under the keyboard keys. When we find active infestations, we have chemical-free methods to kill the pests and not damage the objects. You see one of those methods in progress on the right. One of the times when objects are most at risk is when they are being moved between museums, between storage and exhibition, or even from one shelf to another in storage. The art of packing an object to ship halfway around the world differs from what we do to pack it and keep it safe in climate controlled storage. But both ends of the spectrum require that we identify the risks and figure out how to reduce them. Dust can hold moisture on the surface of an object and cause it to corrode. It can also add a negative layer to a visitor's experience. Grit can cause irreversible damage to historic flooring. For these reasons, dust removal and floor maintenance are activities carried out by preventive conservation teams on a very regular basis. As the risk assessment definition to, of preventive conservation points out, 
identifying risks and putting things in place to reduce them is part of preventive. Natural disasters like hurricanes and earthquakes and man-made disasters like construction site accidents and armed conflict put objects at extremely high risk. We can't usually stop these events from happening, but we can protect collections to reduce damage risk and rehearse emergency response and recovery methods so we can salvage damaged objects as quickly and efficiently as possible. An object that becomes separated from its historical record can lose all of its value, as without firm provenance, what an object is becomes highly questionable. For this reason, preventive conservation includes reducing the deterioration of the knowledge associated with an object, and in practice, in its practice by applying identification labels to objects, which is what's happening on the left. Additionally, if an object can be found when it is, can't be found when it is needed, it loses its value as well. Thus, all object, cha object changes in location must be recorded in collection management systems. In order to know what to do, where the risks are, figure out what needs to happen next, we must look and look closely. The formal terms for this looking in the conservation world are survey and assessments. These activities can involve looking at buildings, exhibition spaces, storage spaces, large collections, small collections, and individual objects. As we look, we identify steps to improve the environment around objects or identify the vulnerabilities of a particular object and then put a plan in place to make the necessary improvements. Reformatting is what we do to keep information and objects accessible as deterioration takes place or equipment becomes obsolete. We digitize crumbling newspapers. We transfer moving images from deteriorating film to more stable digital media. And as we see here, we record the original format of time-based media works. In order to understand why objects degrade and what kind of materials we can use to protect them, we must understand the physical, chemical, and biological makeup of objects, their degradation products, and their agents of deterioration. We build this understanding in part through a wide variety of analytical methods. Because the implementation and creation of preventive procedures is part of our definition of the practice, Preventive conservators must train others to do preventive conservation and learn to write the policies and procedures that are needed. A couple of years ago, I gathered preventive conservation experts from these institutions. The primary reason for the gathering was to discuss whether the Winterthur University of Delaware Program in Art Conservation Should make it possible for conservation graduate students to conservation. During the meeting, the group came up with lists of, of skills a preventive conservator needs to develop. There were 39 soft skills and 49 technical skills and areas of knowledge identified. This does not imply that when a person finishes formal education, they need to have full competence in all of these areas in order to be a preventive conservator. The list represents skills a preventive conservator should be continually developing. Once I hand the webinar back to Jen and we move on to the discussion portion, you will see a series of slides that list these skills and provide more images of preventive conservation in action. The captions on the images will give you an idea of the places people train for this work and the titles of the roles they eventually take on. But one more slide before I hand things back to Jen. Here, the words around the outside of the preventive conservation circle provide labels for many of the areas people will study before ending up practicing preventive conservation. It is not a complete list. There are certainly other pathways. The thing that I hope is clear is that conservation graduate school is certainly one pathway, but there are many more. And with that, I'll pass the webinar back to Jen. 
Thank you, Joelle. Uh, that was an excellent overview of the topic. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask Jessica Pace and Jamie Gleason to join us. Jessica and Jamie have agreed to speak a bit about their own careers in preventive conservation. And with Joelle, they'll be answering any questions from our viewers. And um, well, first off, Jessica and Jamie, I would like to ask you both to introduce yourselves. Um, Jessica, would you start us off? Yes, hi, um, my name is Jessica Pace. I'm the preventive conservator um, at NYU Libraries. And I got my conservation training um, in objects conservation at the Conservation Center at, um, the, um, at NYU. Great, and Jamie? Hi, this is Jamie Gleason. I'm the Associate Conserva Preventive Conservator at the National Gallery of Art. I trained as an objects conservator also at Buffalo State College, and I started at the National Gallery three days after graduation, and I've been here ever since. First, I was a Mellon Fellow in the Object Conservation Lab, and I've been working in preventive conservation for about two and a half years. So that actually brings up a really interesting point. So. Um, I learned during our practice session that actually both of you and Joelle as well came into preventive from other avenues. Um, Jamie, you just mentioned you came in from objects and Jessica, if I'm correct, you also came in from objects. Um, I was yeah, wondering, if, oh, sorry, uh, please go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just uh, curious to hear if there are aspects of your backgrounds that um, you bring to preventive that you feel are particularly beneficial to you, to your current work. Um, yeah, I mean, oh, this is Jessica, I can start. Um, yes, I, I do find that my objects training was very helpful. Um, I should add that uh, I've been at the library for um, almost two years. And prior to that, I worked in objects conservation labs at the Brooklyn Museum and at the Natural, um, American Museum of Natural History. Um, and coming to a library, an academic library was a um, very big change, but I do find that my practice as a objects conservator was very helpful because there are um, many types of materials in the special in the library collections in the special collections in particular, um, and many of those are um, art objects and artifacts um, of various types of materials in construction. So um, I find that I was um, able to advise my colleagues on proper housing and handling of these materials um, and bring in um, a certain expertise that was um, not previously available in the library. Um, and you know, especially uh, when it comes to large rehousing projects that we've been undertaking for the past um, a little bit over a year, um, I find that that is also very useful because um, the way that books um, and materials on paper is housed is often very different from objects. And so uh, we were able to collaboratively, collaboratively um, with other uh, paper conservators and book conserv conservators create, um, you know, different approaches to how we house these diverse materials. Oh, that's really interesting. So it really directly relates to the work that you're doing. Um, Jamie, how do you feel about it? Uh, I have a kind of a more abstract viewpoint on it. I think it, in my experience as an object conservator, I never really had the luxury to specialize on any one particular kind of material. It felt like uh, I was always presented with new types of objects, new materials, new problems. And that kind of equipped me to make the transition into preventive where I'm responsible for an entire collection and works of art that are loaned to us so I, I, I think it was valuable for me to be a, as a, a, my training as an object conservator, um, just because I, I learned to solve problems. I don't always know the answers when I'm going into something, but I can figure it out and I just, I built confidence in myself that I can kind of find a good resolution. And somewhat along those lines, um, I think that you both mentioned that you were the first people hired as preventive conservators in your respective institutions. So it sounds like this role is quite new, both to, both to yourselves, uh, relatively new, and to the field in general. Um, I was wondering if, if either of you, well, really, how that, how that went for you. Did you receive resistance from uh, people who were, you know, 
the existing conservators doing some of these tasks or just how did it go? At, at the National Gallery, um, there was no preventive conservation department before uh, about three years ago. And up until that, for 25 years before that, there was what was known as the Exhibitions and Loans Department. And that department was primarily responsible for anything to do with temporary exhibitions, coordinating loans with other institutions, uh, ensuring that we were meeting requirements for objects that were lent to us. And then it sort of segued slowly into the people that were working in that exhibition and loan department were tasked with a lot of what we would now consider preventive conservation duties, monitoring environments, ensuring a lot of light levels were appropriate for different works of art, um, working on packing, loans, making mounts, installing, installing uh, works of art. So it just kind of morphed into a preventive conservation. So when I came along, uh, I was the first person expressly hired as a preventive conservator. And I think that as a broader conservation division at the National Gallery, people were pretty open to it because it took pressure off the, the treatment labs. They no longer had to put so much of their time into making sure that storage environments were acceptable or the light levels in the galleries were um, what they should be. They still participate in those things, of course, but now we take a lot, we shoulder a lot of those responsibilities. So it, it's all big collaboration. Everybody is working together and many hands make light work. So we don't, I haven't experienced any, any resistance, quite, quite the contrary. Um, similar to what uh, Jamie was talking about, um, I think my role uh, evolved along very similar lines. It, um, had been around for a few years and it had started off as I think a libra librarian or archivist role but then more and more it became obvious that the um, the task that the person is um, asked is being asked to perform or um, the, the roles that were needed is more along the lines of preventive conservation so um, my my role is the is the first time that the preventive conservation uh, conservator role was created um, and I also had not uh, found any resistance um, on the, yeah, people were very, um, on the contrary, very welcoming. And I think um, everyone within the preservation department and also in um, you know, these allied departments that I work with frequently recognize the need for somebody to serve as a liaison between the, um, the, the conservation lab, which is much more, um, you know, treatment oriented and um, what people are doing say in processing or accessioning or in the reading room. Um, so it, it actually works very well um, to be, to have me in, in this role um, because I'm, you know, I'm sort of pulling uh, many different uh, departments together to, to resolve these, these problems that we might be finding. Hmm. That's really interesting that both of you mentioned um, the amount of collaboration with other staff that you have and, um, I was wondering, Joelle mentioned that as well. She put up that slide that showed a number of other uh, roles of people that she works with in general. Joelle, I was wondering, would you have anything to add to that um, or in general about how preventive conservation is still a burgeoning field and there are many other people uh, involved in the work as well? Sure. Um, I, think, I think both uh, Jessica and Jamie pointed to uh, maybe what we're seeing here in the U.S. as, as really maybe the formalization of preventive conservation as a um, area in which people specialize. Um, I think you know historically preventive conservation has been going on for years and years and years. If we think of, if you even think back to, um, if we think of our ancestors who knew that it was a good idea to keep a room in the dark or put a dust cover over a piece of furniture when they when they weren't using it. Um, you know, people have been um, have known for a long time that there are different things that we can do to keep objects from deteriorating in the first place. Um, if we think about London in World War II, they did a lot of moving um, objects out to underground ground storage and um, to protect them in that emergency situation. Um, 
it's actually been possible in, in Europe to get a degree in, in preventive conservation for quite a while. Um, it, but so for me, the exciting thing um, here is that we we're now seeing um, in the US the kind of formalization and the, the understanding and the acceptance that um, having people who really focus on preventive conservation um, it is, a, is a great thing for all of us. So along those lines, we do have a few questions from the audience for you about um, about the, I guess, uh, the, the, the graduate program that you are spearheading um, with preventive conservation as a um, focus or as a specialty. And mm -hmm. um, so one of the questions was whether you believe that the field of preventive conservation as a specialty is on the rise for graduate students. Um, so whether you are, see, are hoping to see more of that in the future or whether you believe you'll see more of that. Um, I am hoping that we'll see more of it, and I and we are seeing more of it um, in the admissions process this year. Um, we um, saw many people, many more people coming through talking about their preventive experience and their interest in continuing um, that uh, development of that expertise in, in preventive conservation. We do actually have our um, first preventive conservation major. She's a current first year in the program and, and so next year she'll be majoring in, in preventive conservation and um, there were others in the admissions process who seem like they're um, headed in, in that direction as well. So I, I do definitely see it as a um, something that's going to continue to grow and I think you know the slide that um, talked about uh, Glenn Wharton um, defining preventive conservation as sustainable conservation. I think in our world, as we're more and more focused on um, economic and financial and social sustainability, I think preventive conservation is something that um, really speaks to that for people. So I do see it as a, as a growing profession. And Joelle, along those same lines, if I can continue this line of questioning just a little longer, um, people are curious about what the curriculum will involve for uh, this current preventive major and future ones. Sure. Um, we're still developing it specifically, but um, but I can give you a general outline. And so here at Woodpack, um, for the first year of anybody, um, the year is exactly the same for everybody. So they all go through our, our nine blocks that are focused on different areas of conservation, including preventive, um, and they all take the same science courses. And so whether you're, you're going to specialize in a particular type of treatment conservation or you're going to specialize in preventive conservation, that same year will be the same. Um, and in some ways, per, per a preventive conservator, I think that that first year is even more important, right, because they're going to need to develop a good basic knowledge of all materials, and that's what happens in our, in our first year. Um, in Mel so Melissa King is our, our new, um, is our preventive major for next year, and for her, um, her curriculum will involve some of what you might expect, right? So looking at integrated pest management and understanding how to establish a program and carry carry the program out and making sure that she understands how to treat in, um, infested objects. She'll be working um, on concepts of environmental management and light management and vibration monitoring and all of those things that I think people typically consider consider as um, preventive conservation tasks. Um, the other, other possibilities for her next year, um, she may do some research to help colleagues who um, live in places that don't have access to the materials that we use for storage and display here in the US um, and identify ways that they can use used to um, figure out what materials in their area are most stable. Um, she, we haven't decided for sure, but she may do that research. Um, there, the lists of soft skills that are that are coming up on some of the slides, um, definitely developing those skills so that she can 
be working with all of these different colleagues that she needs to be working with. So making sure that she can run a meeting and she'll probably put together a workshop for area professionals on either storage methods or environmental monitoring. Um, I'm pretty sure she's going to wind up doing a survey for an area institution and then um, help them write a grant proposal to address some of the needs, the preventive conservation needs that they identify during the survey process. Um, and then in her third year, she will do a, a placement with a preventive conservator or a preventive conservation scientist or maybe some of each. Um, so that's the that's the general um, structure of the curriculum. There are a lot of, you know, as Jessica said, she's in a library. Jamie's in a fine art museum. You can imagine that there's a real need for preventive conservators in small historic houses and and um, you know, history museums. And and so depending on the direction that a preventive major kind of sees themselves heading, whether it's in private practice or institutional practice, we will um, we will craft the individual curriculum to fit that person's ultimate goals. Great, it sounds so varied. It sounds like there are just so many skills that are needed. And um, I wanted to ask another question um, that somewhat relates. A, a few people wrote in asking whether the three of you could briefly describe a day in the life of a preventive conservator in order to better understand the skills that you use. Um, this is Jessica. I I thought that was actually a tough question, just because I'm I don't I don't really have I would say a typical day. Um, it kind of rotates depending on you know what is really needed. Um, but I I wrote down I guess a list of things that I could potentially be dealing with in one day. Um, I do move around a lot. We have um, our main um, we're mainly in um, our our main building is uh, Bob's Library. It's just south of Washington Square Park, but we do have another location um, where we receive um, materials to be accessioned. So I'm between locations and sometimes I'm also on site visits. Um, I do quite a lot of that, um, visits to donors um, to or potential donors to go over materials um, to look for anything that might have mold or pest issues um, or to help them pack complex materials. Um, I might have meetings about um, potential loans. Um, I might be consulting with archivists, curators, or um, reading room staff about handling or procedures for packing um, or prepping material for digitization. Um, I also supervise student employees. We have um, pre-programmed uh, pre students, and um, I had a couple of students um, we had a graduate student in museum studies or and um, graduate students from the conservation center. Um, they usually work with me on different preventive tasks. Um, major one that's going on is um, a rehousing project. Uh, we also, um, you know, I'm checking the climate in the um, in our two locations, and I could also be, you know, creating or giving trainings on um, handling or housing or procedures to deal with mold or um, pest contaminated materials. So that is usually sort of the the mixture of of, of um, tasks that I, I would be doing in um, on any given day. And Jamie or Joelle, did either of you have any um, insights to add to that uh, from your own experiences? I kind of like that question because it makes me realize how much I, I like my job. I, I don't really have a typical day, and, and that's one of the things I think that's attractive about this kind of work. I, I, it's not uh, it's not routine. I have to kind of be on my toes. Part of it is putting out fires when something is going wrong, but a lot of it is just you know it's kind of unpredictable. One day I'm working with the building engineers trying to figure out how to keep the environment in a specific gallery where, where we want it, and the next day I'm working with an artist that's here to install. Uh, pieces from their own private collections or to, to mount a show. So it's 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 always something different and there's lots of unique challenges, but that's that's what I like about it. And and I'm not, and I don't really have anything new. I can just echo that I agree that there is no typical day. 
um, in my job and um, you know so a lot of it involves meeting with different people either in the lab or you know in the ex exhibition space or down in the HVAC control system control room um, it's it's incredibly varied it it takes me out of the lab a lot of the time so I'm not really at my desk very often um, I'm you know out talking to people sorting out problems um, you know planning a, a storage uh, project or um, talking you know I spend a fair amount of time on the phone talking to um, different people you know arranging I, I have I have this job that is part teaching and part preventive conservation right so so I also am juggling those two different responsibilities as well Well, those are those are all great answers, and um, it just sounds like there are so many different things that the three of you do, you know, in your days. That um, it sounds like you need all of the skills that Joelle laid out in her slide before. Um, we have a few questions from the audience about the direction that the um, that the field is going, uh, specifically as as uh, preventive conservation evolves towards having more formalized training, um, specifically graduate programs. And we had a few people asking about whether you will in the future need a conservation degree or whether people without a degree will still be able to find work uh, within preventive conservation. And I was wondering if any of you would, um, would have any thoughts on that question. I would, so this is Joelle, and I would respond to that by saying that there will always be plenty of jobs for people who are interested in preventive conservation who haven't gone through a formal conservation training program. Um, the number of institutions, large and small, out there around the world that need help caring for their collection is enormous. And there's no way that the um, conservation training programs could ever um, really train enough preventive conservators. And I think, um, and, and so I think there will always be jobs out there, you know, and that, that slide of the different pathways that people take to get into the practice of preventive conservation, you know, that, that list of possibilities may even grow if we can um, work together to continue to um, sort of spread the the word about the the need and the value of preventive conservation, um, and and so then in the end, I think people will come to the practice of preventive conservation and collection care with different backgrounds. And when we come with different backgrounds, then we just need to recognize where our expertise is and where our limitations are. And so somebody who's trained in a graduate program program and the specialty of preventive conservation will probably have a deeper knowledge of the um, the um, of materials and and the specific way that they degrade and the way we can slow that degradation but somebody who comes to the practice of preventive conservation with a um, engineering degree or a specialty in archaeology will come with different skills and as long as we're all um, trying to practice within our skill set um, I, I think the, the field will continue to need all of us. Great and um, Joelle or oh sorry not Joelle um, my apologies Jessica or Jamie did either of you have anything to add to that? And it's totally fine if you don't. Um, we have other questions for you as well. I might just say that uh, one kind of encouraging thing for people that are looking to get into this field is there, they, there's not a glut of people at this time doing preventive conservation, at least specializing in preventive conservation. So it's there's more opportunities than than in maybe some other specialties, and it, it's uh, it's encouraging. It's something to be excited about. And along those 
somewhat along these lines, um, we have questions asking about the job markets uh, for preventive conservators and other professionals within, um, within preventive work. Um, a few people have asked questions that are very specific, like, for example, do you think that preventive conservation activities could become billable services that are offered uh, within regional centers or private practices? I think that's already already happening. And a lot of small, like historic homes, for example, that don't have a dedicated staff for collection care, they, they reach out to private conservators all the time and get recommendations on environmental conditions, uh, handling, protocols, you name it. So that, that's already happening. And I think it's, it's something that it's a good service that we can provide. And it's happening yeah, in that, regional centers as well. Right, okay. uh, they have um, typically it, it'll be called the preservation services department um, rather than a preventive conservation department, but they're out there doing, um, you know, surveys and, and emergency preparedness training and, and lots of different things for um, the institutions in their area and billing for those hours. And private collectors have an interest in this too. It's, that's another uh, important factor. People want to take care of their, their own objects and their own collections. So they, they look for people that have expertise and, and how to go about doing that. And I just wanted to say, just now we received um, a comment from one of the participants in this webinar, um, just to say that her private practice is exclusively preventive. There you go. Well, we have another question that is specifically for Jessica. Um, Jessica, I understand that you're involved with the Collections Care Network. Would you want to share a bit about it? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Um, so the Collection Care Network um, was formed officially um, in 2012, and um, its goals are to raise awareness of preventive conservation and, um, and also to bring together allied professionals uh, practicing collection care and preventive conservation, uh, you know, with the understanding that it's often not only a collaborative effort, but it's not just conservators who are, um, who are practicing uh, within different cultural institutions um, who are practicing pre uh, preventive um, conservation. It also, um, we also aim to disseminate resources and information um, pertaining to the topic of um, the care of heritage materials and um, to help develop um, standards in practice and training. So um, you'll see that we have workshops at um, AIC um, every year. And also, um, here's my little plug for um, the Collection Care Network. If you're going to be at AIC in Houston at the end of, at the end of May and you're curious um, uh, and you want to know more about the Collection Care Network or you want to get involved, um, we are holding a, a share fair on Friday, June 1st from 1 to 2, so you can stop by and, and learn all about it. Oh, that's great. And Joelle, I believe you're, you are or previously were involved with this organization as well. Did you have anything you'd like to add? <laughs> um, I, su I suppose, I think um, it's, it's been in existence now for five or six years um, and it was created, um, there were a group of I think eight or nine of us who came together um, recognizing the need for a place at AIC that would um, support uh, trained conservators who were interested um, in focusing on preventive conservation, but also um, people uh, who are in the packing and shipping world and, the, and registration and collection care um, who are equally committed to preventive conservation um, and, and provide an environment where all of those people can come together. And I would say that it is, it is still absolutely a, a developing, exciting network. And, and the more folks 
who are out there in conservation training programs, but also in other areas, other areas practicing preventive conservation. The more of those folks we can get together, um, the better. Great. Um, we have one question that might be better for Jessica and Jamie. It's an objects conservation question. Um, someone was asking if you have any specific recommendations um, in terms of preventive conservation for outdoor sculpture? Well, controlling the environment's tricky. Yes. <laughs> but there are, there are things that you can do. One of, the, one of the main problems with outdoor sculpture is vandalism, people, people interacting with, uh, with sculptures in a way that they shouldn't be. So security is a key thing. I, I, would, I would kind of put that in the preventive umbrella. But you can also take precautions against wind and um, yeah, there's there's lots of applications. Some metal uh, sculptures, um, corrosion is obviously a, a big problem in an outdoor environment. But there's uh, there's methods where you can protect metals with a cathodic system, making the uh, the sculpture you want to protect the cathode in an electrochemical cell with a sacrificial metal so that can help prevent corrosion so there's there's things you can do it's it's a little trickier but it's not impossible i think preventively it's also important to think about um creating a maintenance and a maintenance schedule that includes you know scheduled examination of the object to document um, any niche issues that might be developing um, as well as routine you know, if it's appropriate for the object routine, you know, cleaning of it, um, you know, depending on what the materials it is you're talking about. Um, I, I, I guess I, I'm not going to go too deep into what you're cleaning it with. Um, but also, you know, if this is, for example, an archaeological, um, on an archaeological site or in a garden, it, it really depends on, um, you know, whether it's appropriate for there to be shelter to be built for the object, it would, um, if for the sculpture, um, which would really be beneficial um, in preventing um, direct exposure uh, to liquid water. Um, and also, you know, if it's, um, if we're talking about outdoor stone, uh, I think um, we can think about preventive treatments for, um, for biological growth, which would be, um, which would neg negatively impact the stone. And I guess I would, this is Joelle, I would just add that um, I think that um, the area of the, the preventive conservation of outdoor sculpture and murals is one of those places where what's preventive and what's interventive becomes grayer, really, right? And if we think about preventive conservation as, as the deterioration, slowing the deterioration of objects, then, you know, the work that we're doing in terms of, like Jessica, Jessica was talking about, cleaning and, and um, putting barrier layers on uh, sculpture or, or murals, um, you know, for me, that is definitely preventive conservation. But if we were, if we think back to what the more formal definitions are, you know, they're talking about managing the environment around the object rather than actually um, dealing with the specific object, right? And so, so where's where's the line there? Um, but for me, I, I think those practices are definitely preventive conservation. And. We are getting towards the end of our time today, but I think we have time for one more question. And this one's an interesting one. Um, the question is, what are some examples of interesting projects or initiatives in preventive conservation that may not fit within the scope of what most people believe preventive encompasses? And that question is for any of our speakers. And it is a bit of a tough one to, you know, because you have to think about. I can start. Uh, I can start. I think, um, I think it's, you know, it's easier to think about preventive in, in terms of um, environmental management, IPM, vibration monitoring. 
Um, but I think one of the one of the um, things that it is definitely part of preventive conservation has to do with outreach and, and communicating to to people what preventive conservation is and communicating to them what they can do to um, slow the deterioration of their own objects. Um, so actually, we recently had a student who um, went and gave a, a presentation at a conference in Minneapolis on um, that was pulled together after Prince died and she gave a presentation on um, how how to care or the value of caring for all of that memorabilia that people have um, that they've collected you know that relates to Prince and so thinking about outreach and communicating the need for preventive conservation I think is maybe one of the things that people don't immediately identify as something that is preventive conservation but but all of that communication educates people and helps them um, know what they can do um, maybe one other thing that you wouldn't immediately link to preventive conservation but we have a big uh, storage reorganization evaluation project going on right now and one of the things we've built into that project is that in December we're going to gather people from all across the institution to talk about future programming ideas um, with the idea being that if we can understand how we want to work with the collection that's stored then we can build a facility for storage that will make that um, interaction with the collection easier um, and safer for the objects. And so that's an area of preventive conservation in terms of thinking forward and, and how we're linking the use of objects to, to what we're doing to, to slow the um, deterioration and protect the objects. Um, another thing I can think of that might not jump out at people as, um, you know, being preventive conservation is um, thinking about gathering data and um, creating useful metrics to measure how collections are used um, and that you know segues into collaborating with other departments probably in your institution um, you know for example we gather data um, with librarians to figure out which collections are most heavily used and therefore you know we need to um, focus on for rehousing um, but you know it's also important to think about how you can gather data for example about your um, in, in the library you know most of our space is public um, in which areas of the library are being used um, and and how is that affecting um, you know adjacent storage environments for example I think another interesting thing is, and it's not something that I have done a lot, but working directly with artists to help them make more informed decisions about the kinds of materials that they use, their storage practices, which are really all over the place, um, just to get them to think about the long-term preservation of their work. It's something that I think a lot of artists don't really think about, or they have kind of a hard time conceptualizing. So that I think is an opportunity for people that have a specialty in preventive conservation to communicate directly with artists and help them make the right decisions or at least be aware of possible problems that, that could occur down the road. Wow, great answers, all three of you. Um, well, it looks like we are out of time but I'd like to thank um, our audience for joining us today. And if you have any additional questions or suggestions for future webinar topics, please email me at ecpn.aic.webinar at gmail.com. And um, we have a few additional questions that if our speakers are willing, we may address in a follow-up blog post. So uh, look out for that. And at this time, I would also like to sincerely thank all of our speakers for participating in this webinar. Um, it's been a really valuable discussion, and your contributions on this topic have been valuable. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who contributed photos of their preventive conservation work in action. 
and thank all of the ECPN officers and AIC for helping to organize and promote this event, as well as Caitlin Richardson, Melissa King, and Amber Kehoe, who each suggested the topic for this webinar. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.